It's a sad truth with which listeners to this Requiem for the Suicided series on the Corbett Report podcast will be familiar with by now, that those courageous whistleblowers who step forward with key information exposing what's really happening in the corridors of power and soon end up dead in an apparent suicide inevitably become known for the way in which they died rather than the way in which they lived. Dr. David Kelly is no exception. Although I'm sure many of my listeners are, by now, at least passingly familiar with the story of David Kelly's death and the circumstances surrounding it, many people, including myself, are much less versed in the life that he actually lived before those events took place. In order to get some background as to who David Kelly was and what he did during his life, let's take a look at a profile of David Kelly that was released by BBC News in 2004. Quoting from that profile, Quote, At the time the story of his death broke, the Oxford-educated microbiologist had been scientific advisor to the Proliferation and Arms Control Secretariat for more than three years. He was an expert in arms control, working as a weapons inspector in Iraq between 1991 and 1998, following the first Gulf War. Dr. Kelly became senior advisor on biological warfare for the UN in Iraq in 1994, holding the post until 1999. He was sufficiently well-respected to have been nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize by the man who led the Iraq weapons inspections for much of the 1990s, Rolf Ikeas. During a lecture, Dr. Kelly once said, when Iraq invaded Kuwait in August 1990, little did I realize that Saddam Hussein would dictate the next 10 years of my life. He also led all the visits and inspections of Russian biological warfare facilities from 1991 to 1994 under the 1992 trilateral agreement between the US, UK, and Russia. Garth Witte, who worked with him as a UN weapons inspector in Iraq, told the BBC the scientist was internationally regarded as an expert in biological weapons defense who normally coped well under pressure. He was a quiet man who got on with his job. He did it with the highest professional standards, he said. David and Janice Kelly had three daughters, Cyan, 32, and twins Rachel and Ellen, 30. Neighbors described them as a lovely family. His diary suggests he was a keen football and rugby fan, and his other interests include his, his involvement with the Baha'i faith, acting as treasurer to its local spiritual assembly. Dr. Kelly came from a background in agricultural science, and Mrs. Kelly described him as a workaholic who relaxed by tending his vegetable patch. He had been Chief Science Officer at Britain's Natural Environmental Research Council Institute of Virology. He rose through the ranks at the Ministry of Defense's Chemical Research Center at Porden Down in Wiltshire, which he joined in 1984 to become Head of Microbiology. He spent the majority of his career as a consultant to the MOD and other government departments and agencies, advising them on his area of expertise, arms control. Part of his job was to brief journalists on defense issues, and he also had contact with MI6 director Sir Richard Dearlove and others within the Secret Intelligence Service. The inquiry has heard how Dr. Kelly was unhappy with his pay and felt the civil service grading he had been assigned did not reflect his seniority. He was promoted to a new grading, the highest in his service, in February 2003, taking his salary to £61,000. He was not, however, told his pay had been properly assessed before his death. The last week of Dr. Kelly's life saw him at the center of press attention, caught in the middle of the row between the government and the BBC over the dossiers on Iraq's weapons. The expert told the select committee he could not get into his Oxfordshire home after his identity became public knowledge because of the press outside. End quote. Well, I trust that that profile from the BBC does at least highlight some of the very interesting aspects of Dr. Kelly's illustrious career, and we will be returning to some of those interesting parts of his background later on in today's episode. But, of course, Requiem for the Suicided is about the death, unfortunately, of Dr. Kelly. And it's in that point that we will really begin our story. As many people are no doubt aware, Dr. Kelly was found dead in the woods in 2003 at Harrowdown Hill, about 45 minutes from his home in Oxfordshire. This was sensational at the time because Dr. Kelly had been the center, as that profile noted, of a row between the BBC and the UK government over a report filed by B the BBC's Andrew Gilligan claiming that the UK government had knowingly sexed up its dossier on Iraq's weapons of mass destruction and inserted 
erroneous claims about Saddam Hussein's ability to deploy biological and chemical weapons in the battlefield within 45 minutes of giving an order, which sounded, of course, like such an imminent threat that invasion of Iraq was really the only alternative. As the UK government's justification for invading Iraq really did rest on the backbone of that WMD dossier, the death of Dr. David Kelly was of central importance in 2003 and continues to resonate down through the years right to today. Let's turn to a report from Sky News that was filed at the time of Dr. David Kelly's death in July of 2003, in which they talk about the circumstances and the background of his death. The police say the description of the body found on a hillside does match that of Dr. Kelly. It was only a mile away from his home. His wife reported him missing just before midnight last night. He failed to return after saying he was going for a walk yesterday afternoon. The Ministry of Defence said today at no point had he been threatened with suspension or dismissal. But a friend who spoke to his wife at their home this morning said she described her husband as deeply unhappy and furious at how events had unfurled. The formal identification uh, of the body that we found in um, Haradeen Hill will not take place until tomorrow. But what I can say is that the description of the man found there matches the description of Dr David Kelly. And clearly at this very difficult time our condolences must go out to his family, friends and work colleagues. Thames Valley Police is currently treating this incident as an unexplained death whilst we await the results of post-mortem and while forensic examinations continue um, at the scene in Haradeen Hill. Dr Kelly felt the full heat of the public spotlight when he gave evidence to the Foreign Affairs Select Committee this Tuesday. He was grilled by MPs about his meetings with the BBC reporter Andrew Gilligan, who claimed he'd been told by a source Downing Street had sexed up their dossier on Iraq's weapons of mass destruction. Do you believe that the document was transformed, the September dossier, was it transformed by Alistair Campbell? I don't believe that at all. Hmm. When you met Mr Gilligan on the 22nd of May, he says in his article that he met a source in a central London hotel on that day. Did you meet him in a central London I hotel? Did. You did. In your own opinion, do you believe that you were the main source for Mr Gilligan's article on the 1st of June? No, my belief is that I'm not the main source. Do you know who the main source is? No. This afternoon, can you tell me those journalists who you do recall having met in the time scale? what are their names? Having met? Yes. I've met very few journalists. Well, yes, I, I heard few, but who are the ones who are in your mind's eye at this moment? What's their names? I th that will be provided to you by the Ministry. No, no, I'm asking you now. This is the High Court of Parliament, and I want you to tell the committee who you've met. On this occasion, I think it's a proper the Ministry of Defence communicates that to you. And do you know of any other inquiries which have been gone on in the department to seek the source, to clarify, in addition to you or instead of you, or apart from you? None whatsoever? No. No. I reckon you're chaff. You've been thrown up to divert to our probing. Have you ever felt like a fool guy? I mean, you've been set up, haven't you? That's not a question I can answer. But do you feel that? No, I accept the process that's going on. I have to. I'm sorry, I accept. I accept the process that's happening. I... And um, why did you go along with it, Dr. Kelly? You were being exploited, weren't you? I wouldn't say I was being exploited. Well, I, you were being exploited to rubbish Mr. Gilligan in a source, quite clearly. I, find, I just found myself to be in this position, out of my own honesty of acknowledging the fact that I had interacted with him. I don't think he was put under undue pressure from the committee's point of view, but obviously this was a man who was unused to the, uh, if you like, the, the, the Westminster village. He was not used to select committees. He was a, a, a government research scientist who was not a government spokesman, so he would not probably have been very comfortable giving evidence to that committee. David Kelly was a highly regarded scientist who'd held top positions throughout his career. He was 59 years old, married and worked at the MOD as senior advisor on weapons of mass destruction. Past jobs included head of microbiology at the chemical defense establishment at Porton Down. He'd been a weapons inspector in Iraq visiting the country 37 times. In 1994 he was appointed senior advisor to the UN on biological warfare. 
The Prime Minister was informed about the developments on his flight from Washington to Tokyo. He's arrived in Japan without any of his senior advisers, including Alistair Campbell. A judicial inquiry is now set to be launched into all the circumstances surrounding the case. But Sky's political editor, Adam Bolton, who was with the Prime Minister on the flight, doesn't think that will avert the growing crisis. The government just seems to be getting more and more admired. And uh, it has to be said that looking from the outside, if the pressure has led to the death of Dr. Kelly, it's difficult uh, to believe uh, that uh, it, the cause of that is not Alistair Campbell's decision uh, to fight the BBC so hard. In the process of fighting the BBC, Dr. Kelly, as we've just been hearing, uh, was exposed to the pressure of going before the committee uh, and what happened afterwards. That said, uh, we should say that I understand uh, Dr. Kelly's MP, the Conservative Robert Jackson, and indeed some in Dr. Dr. Kelly's family are pointing the finger in the direction of the BBC, saying the BBC could have done more uh, to clear up his role uh, in all of this. But this is now a very grave uh, governmental crisis for Mr. Blair. If I was the Prime Minister, I believe I would cut short this visit and return home. There are very many questions that will need to be asked over the coming days. And I think uh, if I was the Prime Minister, I'd want to be back here to do, deal with those. This is obviously terribly, terribly sad news. and. Everybody's thoughts and good wishes will be with Dr. Kelly's family and friends and colleagues uh, at this awful time. I welcome the fact that the Prime Minister has said there will obviously have to be a full-scale inquiry into what on earth led to this happening. It would be wrong to comment further before we have more details of that, but at the moment this is a desperately tad, sad turn of events. A parish priest was escorted by police to the Kelly's family home this afternoon in Oxfordshire to give what comfort he could to his wife and three daughters. As a former UN weapons inspector, Dr. Kelly visited Iraq dozens of times. After Iraq invaded Kuwait, he said little did he realize Saddam Hussein would dictate the next 10 years of his life. David Chater, Sky News. An interesting report to be sure, and no less interesting for the figure who appears at 319 of that uh, the YouTube clip. And this unidentified figure, his name is not does not appear on the screen, and I don't know who he is, but he is implanting what will become, of course, the, the meme, the explanation, the official narrative, if you will, of Dr. Kelly's emotional and psychological state at the time of his death basically saying that the proceedings at the select committee in which he was forced to appear before to talk about his interactions with Andrew Gilligan, well, he, that committee had just been so grating on him and the idea of answering these questions and being put through this this extremely stressful situation was obviously what made him snap and go over the edge and commit suicide. And um, it's, well, it's interesting to know that the speculation, as soon as his body was discovered, was along those lines, and that ultimately ended up being the official narrative. But uh, but leaving that aside, well, the, the points are, are there to be at least analyzed. Do they have any merit whatsoever? I mean, certainly it must have been a, str a stressful situation for anyone to go through that type of process. But was David Kelly the type of person who would have buckled under such pressure? And that's an interesting question to ask, considering his job as a weapons inspector and going into Iraq multiple times, going into Russia and other, other places where his presence was obviously not always welcome and being under quite a bit of duress and stress from that position. And he had always come across uh, as someone who was completely in control and was very uh, meticulous and accurate and all of those other things, and did not ever seem to buckle under pressure, so to, it's certainly uh, worth pondering whether this event would have been a psychological motivator for him to commit suicide. But of course, we're not just talking about the emotional state of doc Dr. David Kelly, although that does play into it. There's also a discrepancy between the official narrative of the way and the manner in which he committed suicide and the details as we know them and as they've been testified to by various sources. And that is where we will pick up the next part of this story. The story, of course, really begins to pick up as shortly after his death when, as we heard intimated in that report, the Tony Blair government, in fact, did call a, for a, an inquiry into the death of David Quet Kelly. And an inquiry, for those not in the know, is an official review of events or actions ordered by a government body in the UK, Ireland, or Canada, 
but most notably it is it does not actually have subpoena power and uh, witnesses are not compelled to testify they are not sworn in so it actually has less less of a scope and less of a mandate to actually get to the bottom of what actually happened in a major uh, situation like for example 77 than a coroner's inquest does so that's that's very interesting in and of itself rather than holding an inquest there was a public inquiry into David Kelly's death and the Hutton inquiry into David Kelly's death so-called because of chairman of the inquiry Lord Hutton came back in January of 2004 with its verdict that, yes, indeed, David Kelly's death was the result of suicide, and it largely cleared the government of wrongdoing while laying the blame at the Big Brother Corporation's doorstep, the BBC, that is. So it it was obviously met with quite a bit of skepticism among the public, but swallowed completely wholesale by a number of media organizations who typically tow the official government line in such situations. But exactly as the 9-11 Commission report, for example, did nothing to answer the deep and abiding questions about what actually took place on 9-11, so the Hutton inquiry left many more questions than it answered, and it was quite readily and quite quickly attacked from all sides. Because of the many glaring holes in the uh, evidence that was presented and the things that were not followed up by the Hutton inquiry... And it's there that we will continue our investigation into David Kelly's death by taking a look at a rather unusual source, the BBC itself, which puts out a series called The Conspiracy Files, which has featured episodes on 9-11, on 7-7, on the Lockerbie bombing, on the OKC bombing, and on David Kelly's death, among other subjects. And it's an interesting series because although, of course, it does always end up promoting the official narrative or the government position on everything and basically saying that anyone who questions that is a wild-eyed, crazy, kooky conspiracy theorist, it does generally not too bad a job of actually presenting some of the real questions about these events and trying to put them into some type of perspective. It's not like the ridiculous, uh, cartoonish hit pieces and propaganda that comes out of uh, the United States media, it's actually somewhat balanced and and actually does provide some ideas uh, that are worth looking into. So we're going to listen to an extended excerpt from the Conspiracy Files episode on the death of David Kelly, which looks at and I think treats fairly respectably some of the serious concerns about the Hutton inquiry and its findings. The end of David Kelly's life was the beginning of a mystery. What really happened on Harrow Downhill? Lord Hutton said the BBC was at fault in broadcasting unfounded allegations, and Andrew Gilligan had admitted mistakes in his reporting. Lord Hutton concluded Dr Kelly killed himself. He found public exposure very stressful, feared he'd lose his job, felt unable to share his problems and was gripped by a profound sense of hopelessness. The major factor was the severe loss of self-esteem, resulting from his feeling that people had lost trust in him and from his dismay at being exposed to the media. Lord Hutton also gave the official account of how Dr Kelly died, by completely severing an artery in his wrist and taking an overdose of painkillers. Dr Kelly took his own life by cutting his left wrist, and that his death was hastened by his taking coproximal tablets, I'm further satisfied that there was no involvement by a third person in Dr. Kelly's death. So, officially, it's a suicide, and the case is closed. But the Conspiracy Files series commissioned an opinion poll of a thousand people in Britain. The telephone poll found that almost one in four people questioned believed Dr. Kelly did not commit suicide. So despite a two and a half million pound judicial inquiry, there remain many unanswered questions and secrecy breeds conspiracy. A group of doctors and consultants have written a number of published letters saying that they don't accept the cause of death given by Lord Hutton. Their letters have made them front-page news, but have not drawn an official response from the government. The letters by the doctors are coordinated by Rowena Thursby. She has set up a website called the Kelly Investigation Group. 
to look into Dr. Kelly's death. People are very, very interested in the death of Dr. Kelly, and they don't necessarily believe the official line, which is that he took his own life. Um, they find the whole thing rather suspicious, and they write to me telling that I'm do me that I'm doing very important work, and that they, they're you know, encouraging me to continue. David Kelly's body was found by two volunteer searchers, Paul Chapman and Louise Holmes, with the help of their dog. They said they took care not to disturb the scene or get too close to the body and contacted the police as soon as they found him. Their description was of a body slumped or sitting up against a tree. The first two search volunteers who found the body um, clearly report, reported that his body was sitting up against a tree. The searchers told a police officer, DC Graham Coe, how to find the body, and he stayed alone with it for 30 minutes. DC Coe said he only observed the scene and never got close to the body, and stayed about seven or eight feet away. When the other people came along, the paramedics, the policemen, the detective, um, the forensic pathologist, all those people subsequently said that the body was flat on its back, not touching the tree at all. So completely horizontal on its back. So, which indicates to me, to anybody sensible, that the body was moved. But if the body was moved, who would have moved it and why? Rowena Thursby believes that DC Co. should have been questioned by Lord Hutton about what happened when he was alone with the body. To find out what he was doing for half an hour by the body, or to question directly on whether he'd actually moved the body and put it to him that, that these witnesses say one thing and these witnesses say another. How do you explain that? You were with the body for the half an hour on your own. Did you move the body? Lord Hutton says that such discrepancies in eyewitness accounts are quite normal and do not disturb him. He saw photographs of the body that he believes are consistent with all the descriptions given. But discrepancies did trouble the paramedics. 11 months after Lord Hutton's final report, they took the unprecedented step of calling a press conference. Dave Bartlett and Vanessa Hunt had attended dozens of suicide attempts in which someone had cut a wrist, but they found the scene of David Kelly's death unusually free of bloodstains. I suppose everyone was surprised with the outcome. Like I say, we're not medical experts. All we commented on was the amount of blood, blood over the body. We can only say what we saw on that morning, and um, there just didn't appear to be a substantial amount of blood loss either onto the, the clothing or around the area. The paramedics who attended the body, um, they were very, very shocked to find that there's very, very little blood around. In fact, they, they've attend, they had attended attempted suicides and actual suicides in about, over a period of about 15 years. And there was always masses and masses of blood all over the place. So they didn't feel that he, he could have died in that way. The Hutton report had different witness accounts. Some saw more blood. The pathologist said there was a significant volume of blood, and the forensic biologist said that there was a fair bit of blood, consistent with a severed artery, and some had soaked into the ground. Neither of them would speak to this programme to clarify exactly what they meant. One of the group of doctors and consultants who have published letters questioning the official cause of death is vascular surgeon John Skur, a specialist in veins and arteries. I, did, I personally, I don't think I've ever seen anybody die from wrist injuries. Um, I have seen a lot of wrist injuries. It was a very common cry for help type attempt at suicide rather than a genuine attempt at killing themselves. 
John Skur believes that if Dr. Kelly had really meant to kill himself, he cut the wrong artery in the wrong way. Frankly, I don't believe that simply cutting an ulnar artery will cause death. The radial artery runs down here. The ulnar artery runs down this side of the wrist. The ulnar artery is relatively deep, and to get the ulnar artery, you would need to cut in that sort of direction, which is an unusual way of holding a knife. The body has a lot of self-defensive uh, mechanisms. I mean, as you know, if you take a knife and cut your finger, you don't bleed to death. And the reason you don't bleed to death is you produce all sorts of clever things which seal the circulation and the bleeding stops. If you cut a large artery, then uh, you may not be able to stop the bleeding. Now, the thing we know about the ulnar artery is it's quite small. And so if uh, Dr. Kelly had cut it cleanly, it would have gone into spasm and it would have, you know, probably oozed for a little while, trickled. He might have lost a few hundred mils of blood and then it would have stopped. Officially, David Kelly's death was not only caused by hemorrhaging from a wrist wound. Lord Hutton says that an overdose of the painkiller Coproximal probably also played a part. Packaging found with the body meant that up to 29 Coproximal tablets were available to Dr. Kelly. But the toxicologist who gave evidence to the Hutton inquiry could not be definitive about how many tablets were taken. Tests he carried out suggested it was an overdose, that Dr. Kelly had 10 times more than a normal medical dose of Coproximal. But he also said that Dr. Kelly had less than is usually fatal. The forensic toxicologist to the Hutton inquiry said that there was only a third of what's normally a fatal amount in his blood. That's an area which does need proper exploration by people who have expertise in in toxicology, and that could only be done at an inquest. One of Dr. Kelly's close friends, who is himself an eminent toxicologist, was concerned about the way this evidence was dealt with by the Hutton inquiry. Well, if I comment on the toxicology, which is the assessment of the drugs that were present in David, I thought it was incredibly superficial. You need to know something about the behavior of the drug, their um, concerns about where you take the blood sample from. It might concentrations vary um, at different sites of the body. And might there be changes in the blood levels after somebody dies with these drugs? These are all important factors that you need to know when you're interpreting a blood level after somebody dies. And that inquiry didn't go ahead. It is not only the medical causes of Dr. Kelly's death that are disputed. People also question whether there was evidence that he intended to commit suicide. The Hutton report says that Dr. Kelly became suicidal because he felt humiliated and that his self-esteem, his integrity and his job were threatened. To find out if Dr. Kelly really reached that point, you need to know who he was. Well, welcome to the Defence Microbiology Division. His job required a balance between the open world of briefing the media about the risks posed by germ warfare and the secret world of intelligence. Dr. Kelly had the highest level of security clearance and briefed the Defence Intelligence staff MI6 and the CIA. Dr. Kelly was involved in the preparation of the dossier that formed the basis of the government's case for war against Iraq. After the war, when no weapons of mass destruction were found in Iraq, Dr. Kelly talked to a number of journalists about the dossier and came under suspicion of being Andrew Gilligan's secret source. As rumors swirled around, David Kelly volunteered his name to the MOD. The Ministry of Defence has announced that one of its employees has come forward to volunteer that he met the BBC reporter, Andrew Gilligan, in an unauthorised meeting. The government held off naming Dr Kelly initially, but they revealed details of his identity, which enabled the media to identify him, something which has angered a former Deputy Chief of Defence Intelligence. I think if they decided that 
they didn't want the name to come out, they could have protected him. They just left so many clues that they all pointed to poor old Dr. Kelly. When the government finally confirmed Dr. Kelly's name to the media, he was subjected to public scrutiny by a televised parliamentary committee. After two interviews by his employers and public exposure in the media, Dr. Kelly had been under a lot of strain. But he spent many years doing a very difficult job in a hostile environment, making 37 visits to Iraq. Would someone like that really buckle and kill himself during a period of stress? Not according to one of his closest colleagues. One of the reasons I didn't accept the suicide story from the beginning is I would not consider David a person that would become suicidal. Uh, you know, we all have depressions. And there's some of us that I, and I, David is included in those, that would endure and find other ways out. On the last day of his life, Dr. Kelly was telling friends that he would continue with the job that was so important to him. He was replying to messages from friends and colleagues that he would soon be back in Baghdad. His daughter was due to get married in a couple of months. I would feel most unlikely that he would want to essentially desert, uh, abandon his family uh, and end his life prematurely. And he certainly could have looked forward to many more years of happy life. But amongst the emails on that last day, there was one sinister message. It doesn't appear to show that Dr. Kelly was a threat to himself, but that he felt threatened by others. He told his friend, journalist Judith Miller, that there were many dark actors playing games. So this report was released in February of 2007, and even at that time, there were still numerous troubling things, uh, aspects of this case that obviously were worthy of attention and still are. There are some very serious questions to be answered about the type and the nature of the cuts and wounds that were inflicted on D David Kelly's body, the fact that he had swallowed these 29 pills, uh, despite the fact, well, we'll come to that later, that he actually had an aversion to swallowing pills of any sort, and many other things uh, besides the lack of blood on the scene, the fact that the body had been moved, and even his emotional state and the fact that he had uh, talked about dark uh, forces at work. So certainly there were reasons uh, to, to question the Hutton inquiry and its finding of suicide. But having said that, of course, the Conspiracy Files eventually goes on to give the official narrative last and tries to make their experts look like the real experts, despite the fact that they, they put out complete and utter twaddle like this. On his last morning alive, Dr. Kelly sent emails to friends saying he'd soon be back in Baghdad. Is that really the action of someone considering suicide? Professor Peter Tyra has studied Dr. Kelly's emails. It looked as though the ones on the morning of the 17th were rather stereotyped, whereas the earlier emails that he sent in July were much more informative and there were more sort of warms coming through them. And I think that there was a certain detachment of those emails on the morning of the 17th of July, which made me think that he'd already decided that he was going to take his own life when he was writing those. As well as sending emails, David Kelly was receiving them. One was about an MP who had asked a parliamentary question about what disciplinary action the MOD was going to take against him. He took a knife he'd had since childhood on his last walk towards Harrow Downhill. Oh yes, well, if Professor of Psychiatry Peter Tyrer of Imperial College London says that his emails didn't show the warmth that his earlier emails did on that day when he was found dead, that certainly must indicate that he was planning on suicide. And I believe him because he has a lot of letters after his name, and uh, he's presented to us as an expert. But I think, uh, obviously, that report was filed in February of 2007, and since that time, there has been 
a barrage of information coming out that continues to question the official David Kelly suicide verdict. We could look, for example, to the Times Online, which had a post about Norman Baker, the British MP, who has been quite uh, at the forefront of questioning the suicide verdict of David Kelly's death. And his book, The Strange Death of David Kelly, was reviewed by Nick Rufford in the Times Online from November 11th, 2007, and it contains some interesting nuggets, such as, quote, Consider this. Several senior doctors write to a newspaper to take issue with the official explanation of how David Kelly died. John Skurr, an expert in vascular surgery, concludes, Frankly, I don't believe that simply cutting an ulnar artery will cause death. The first paramedics to attend Kelly's body on a wooded hillside near his Oxfordshire home note that the small amount of blood does not seem consistent with fatal bleeding. There's more. The pathologist who pronounced the cause of death later has a change of heart. Then it emerges that police found no fingerprints on the knife that Kelly supposedly used to kill himself or on the water bottle lying next to the body. And why did Operation Mason, the police investigation into his death, start nine hours before Kelly was even reported missing? End quote. Yes, not only was the police investigation into Kelly's disappearance entitled Operation Mason, it actually started before he was ever reported missing. That's a particularly interesting piece of information, especially when covered with a report from the Daily Mail from June of 2010. Dr. David Kelly, the damning new evidence that points to a cover-up by Tony Blair's government. Among other interesting points in that article, there's this very interesting revelation. Quote, Our new revelations include the ambiguous nature of the wording on Dr. Kelly's death certificate, the existence of an anonymous letter which says his colleagues were warned to stay away from his funeral, and an extraordinary claim that the wallpaper at Dr. Kelly's home was stripped by police in the hours after he was reported missing, but before his body was found. End quote. So again, a lot of indications that there were some very strange uh, things going on in Operation Mason, the supposed investigation into his death that started actually before he was even reported missing. So definitely some interesting things to explore there. But perhaps the biggest bombshell to really come out since the release of the conspiracy files in 2007 was this report from June of 2009. The controversy over the death of a high-profile government scientist has once again risen from the ashes. According to a 2003 British government report, Dr. David Kelly apparently committed suicide after he was exposed as being a civil service insider questioning the war in Iraq. This was during the height of the public opposition to the war, when the British government was accused of overstating and even fabricating the case against Saddam Hussein's weapons of mass destruction. In vain. Six years later, a team of specialist doctors are now launching a legal challenge to prove Kelly was in fact assassinated. Hemorrhage from this small artery, the ulnar artery, uh, on the wrist where there was a cut on Dr. Kelly, Kelly did not cause bleeding so rapid or so voluminous that he would have died. Is that as doctors we do not accept without a great deal of reluctance that he took his own life. And we live in what purports to be a country of laws and the laws in this case, the law in this case has been subverted, undermined and we won't have it. This week, Kelly's colleague and close confidant, Mae Pedersen, has also weighed in. She says Kelly's weak right arm and inability to swallow pills make it impossible to believe he could inflict enough harm to kill himself. Liberal Democrat MP Norman Baker, who has written a book on the case, agrees. The threshold for a verdict of suicide in a coroner's court is beyond reasonable doubt. I challenge anyone to say that with the evidence I've produced and the doctors have produced, that that conclusion can be reached in David Kelly's situation. What are the implications of the possibility that David Kelly was murdered? Well, there are significant implications for Parliament, uh, which has failed to investigate this matter properly. There are implications for the Attorney General and the legal system, which has failed to investigate the matter properly. There are implications for the media, which has clearly failed to do its job. 
The push to reinvestigate Kelly's death has been timed with the broader Iraq war inquiry, which Prime Minister Gordon Brown announced in June. If the government wants to draw a line under the whole matter, it will have no choice but to investigate Kelly's case too. Farina Alam, Press TV, London. This story was obviously quite a development and caused quite a stir in the British political establishment because this group of doctors had a certain amount of gravitas. This was not a kooky bunch of conspiracy theorists who were calling for a, an actual inquest, coroner's inquest, into David Kelly's death. So it did start a quite a campaign of uh, that took place in certain media forums over the pr- preceding couple of years, the proceeding from that 2009 story, couple of years, in which, well, may- basically the Mail Online and the Independent tended to be the media vehicles in the UK that were arguing most strenuously for that inquiry, uh, sorry, the inquest into David Kelly's death. And, for example, some of the stories that came out through the Mail Online include this one from the 9th of August, 2010. There wasn't much blood about. Detective who found weapons expert David Kelly's body raises questions over his death. And that goes into the tale of Detective Constable Graham Coe, who did find David Kelly's body, and how he said that there wasn't much blood at the scene. Uh, We also have this story from the Mail Online on the 12th of September, 2010. Dr. David Kelly's body had obviously been moved. Paramedic at death scene reveals concerns over Hudden inquiry, talking about the paramedic at the scene of his death, who was talking about the fact that his body had been moved. Uh, Once again, putting on record some of the things that were raised in that Conspiracy Files episode. Uh, In November of 2010, the Mail Online published, Drug expert claims David Kelly was murdered as he could not have taken overdose. Quote, Police have been urged to start a murder inquiry into Dr. David Kelly's death following further allegations that he did not commit suicide. Officers have been told the government scientist could not have taken an overdose of painkillers. This overdose was found by the original pathologist to be one of the causes of his death. Dr. Andrew Watt, an experienced clinical pharmacologist, says he has told Thames Valley Police it is not possible Dr. Kelly could have swallowed more than a safe dose of two coproximal tablets because there was so little in his system after his death. End quote. We have this story from the Mail Online from the 14th of May, 2011. Mystery of the helicopter that landed at the scene of Dr. Kelly's death after his body was found. Quote, A helicopter mysteriously landed at the scene of Dr. David Kelly's death shortly after the body was found. The aircraft only remained on the ground for five minutes before leaving, suggesting it either deposited or collected somebody or something. Details from its flight log, released under the Freedom of Information Act, showed that the helicopter, hired by Thames Valley Police, landed at Harrowdown Hill in Oxfordshire at 10.55 a.m. on July 18, 2003, 90 minutes after the body was discovered by volunteer search terms. Significantly, the flight log has been heavily redacted, making it impossible to know who was on board or what its exact purpose was. End quote. Yes, nothing suspicious about that, and I'm sure the secrecy surrounding that flight log is absolutely vital to national security, and that's why the public is being denied the knowledge of what its own police agency that is being paid for out of the taxpayers of the United Kingdom's own pocket Um, Again, just another case of secrecy gone insane, and the only possible reason for redacting things from the flight log would be because the government doesn't want you to know who was on board that helicopter or what its purpose was, because that would be at odds with the official narrative of Dr. Kelly's death. Of course, on the other hand, it should be cautioned that we should not go too far in extrapolating too much from these pieces of occulted information, these secretive and redacted flight logs and other such documents that the government doesn't want us to see, because, of course, there's always the possibility that they are a honey trap. That is something that is laid out for people of a speculative nature to draw them into creating big conspiracy theories about what happened, and then to have the rug pulled out from them with, by the full document then being released. And that's exactly what happened with a key document in the entire uh, D- David Kelly case. And it's one that many, many people who posit that there was something more than suicide going on latch onto and was widely publicized at the time uh, that it happened, but is uh, the follow-up is not so widely publicized. So what am I talking about? Well, we can find out from a 25th of January 2010 Mail Online article, David Kelly post-mortem to be kept secret for 70 years as doctors accuse Lord Hutton of concealing vital information. 
quote, vital evidence which could solve the mystery of the death of government weapons inspector Dr. David Kelly will be kept under wraps for up to 70 years. In a draconian and highly unusual order, Lord Hudden, the peer who chaired the controversial inquiry into the Dr. Kelly scandal, has secretly barred the release of all medical records, including the results of the post-mortem and unpublished evidence. The move, which will stoke fresh speculation about the true circumstances of Dr. Kelly's death, comes just days before Tony Blair appears before the Chilcot inquiry into the Iraq War. End quote. As I say, that piece of information garnered quite a bit of uh, steam and quite a bit of attention in the alternative press as another key indicator of the cover-up in the death of Dr. David Kelly. But what was not so widely reported on came in October of 2010, and we'll find this in The Guardian. David Kelly post-mortem reveals inquiries were self-inflicted. Government releases previously secret medical files on death of weapons inspector at center of BBC's Iraq dossier story. And there are links in this story to actually read that post-mortem examination, which uh, Lord Hutton had sealed for 70 years, and the government decided to release just several months after that became public. Well, there it is. You can go and read it for yourself. And yes, it does toe the official government line that uh, the the wounds appeared to be self-inflicted and that he had consumed the analgesics by himself and that it was indeed a suicide. So, in fact, yes, they had made a document completely secret that contained no real details that hadn't been really widely known uh, otherwise that were of any importance and that really just towed the official line. So why did they make it secret for 70 years and then reveal it a few months later? Well, it did certainly go some way towards discrediting those people who drew too widely on that, that piece of secreted information and speculated too freely with it. Well, it discredited those people in the minds of certain other people in the public. Well, there is much, much, much more to go into besides, and I could mention such things as the the friends of Dr. Kelly who have talked about his uh, his inability to use his right hand properly, and that how that meant that he could not have inflicted the wound in his left wrist as the official government line holds, or his uh, aversion to swallowing pills of any sort, or that type of thing. There has been a lot of other things that have come out besides to point to the suspicious nature of Dr. Kelly's death, and to warrant a full coroner's inquest into the death of Dr. Kelly. But let's cut to the chase, because this is something that is still very much in the headlines, and for reasons that will become apparent shortly, we'll start by taking a look at this article from May of 2011. No need for inquest on Dr. Kelly, says PM, leading to anger as Cameron appears to prejudge review. Quote, David Cameron has said that he didn't believe a full inquest into the death of weapons expert Dr. David Kelly was necessary. The Prime Minister apparently preempting the findings of an official review of the Kelly file by the Attorney General, said he did not think it was necessary to take that case forward. End quote. So, yes, there you have it. The Attorney General of the UK was expected earlier this month to announce whether or not he would hold a full inquiry into the death of David Kelly, and there's the Prime Minister David Cameron prejudging the review by saying he didn't feel anything was necessary, a sentiment that was echoed by Tony Blair on the 9th of June 2011, just hours before Dominic Grieve made his decision as to whether or not to open an inquiry into that death. Um, the Attorney General, uh, Dominic Greaves, is expected to make an announcement today as to whether there should be a new inquiry into the death of Dr. David Kelly. And that, I think you've written, is, is something that has weighed heavily on your mind over, over the years. Would you welcome a new inquiry? I think I'll, I'll let him make his statement on this. Um, I mean, there was, a, there was an inquiry w- which went for six months, headed by a, a senior law lord. So, um, I mean, he, he'll obviously make his statement. I, I really know nothing about that Were the questions answered sufficiently? for you at the last inquiry? Well, as far as I know, they were, but maybe he has different information, but I, frankly, I doubt it, but, but I'll, I'll wait and see what he says, and I, I honestly don't... I've, I've, no, I've, I've no information that um, is different from the information given to that inquiry that went, as I say, over six months. But obviously we'll cooperate with inquiry if he decides... Well, that I, we, we always cooperate with inquiries, and so we should, of course, but, uh, but I think what he will focus on is whether there really is anything left from the inquiry, as I say, that went over six months and, you know, it was one of the most detailed inquiries that, that has taken place. So on your the view issue is like there is no need to reopen My this. view is I don't, I don't know whether he knows something that I don't know. Hmm. Any guesses as to whether or not Attorney General Dominic Grieve decided to open that inquiry? 
Because of the interest in the political issues that formed the backdrop to Dr Kelly's death, a significant number of people have raised concerns about his death and the process used to investigate it, and have called for a new inquest to be set up. At this stage, only the High Court can order an inquest, and then only on an application made by me or by another with my consent. I was asked last year to make such an application and have since then been provided with a large amount of information which is said to support the case for an inquest. Mr Speaker, having given all the material that's been sent to me the most careful consideration, I have concluded that the evidence that Dr Kelly took his own life is overwhelmingly strong. Further, there is nothing I've seen that supports any allegation that Dr Kelly was murdered or that his death was the subject of any kind of conspiracy or cover-up. In my view, no purpose would be served by my making an application to the High Court for an inquest, and indeed I have no reasonable basis for doing so. There is no possibility that at an inquest, a verdict other than suicide would be returned. So here we are seemingly at the end of a very long road of attempts to get a proper inquiry into David Kelly and his untimely death. And are we really at the end of that road? Well, that's a good question, and one that I wanted to put to Michael Powers, and he was invited to appear on this program to talk about what the doctors are planning to do now that the the inquiry has been officially denied. But he has returned uh, the email to say that he will not be appearing anytime soon, as new information about David Kelly, the file, has been released, and the doctors are currently going through that information before they decide what to do. But there you are, and we are at this rather discordant stage of things uh, as far as the official inquiries and inquests and, and trying to get to the bottom of this. But, of course, the underlying question here is... Why? What is the point of all of this? And why is the death of David Kelly really important? Why would he have been murdered? I mean, that's an important question to establish if we are to uh, question whether or not this was a suicide or whether he was suicided. Certainly, we must be looking at the motive. And although the motive might seem self-evident at one level, well, he was a government whistleblower, and if he really was responsible for talking too much about the Iraq weapons of mass destruction dossier and how it had been altered and who by, well, then he had to be get gotten rid of. But on another level altogether, I don't know if that really makes sense at all. I mean, certainly the fact that there were no weapons of mass destruction was discovered and has now been an established fact for a very long time, and one that evidently did not really derail the uh, the, Bu the Bush presidency or the the Blair prime, prime ministership, and did not derail the war effort in any noticeable way, and... In fact, still many people in the States seem to actually believe there were weapons of mass destruction, so it just goes to show what admitting things out in the open will do. Um, it, if people don't want to hear it, they won't hear it, no matter whether it's the truth or not. So, so it doesn't seem like this would be the type of thing that would be, that would be in the interest of a government agency to silence Dr. Kelly. If he had said something about the weapons of mass destruction dossier, then that was already out in the open, and it was going to affect uh, policies and things in the future less and less. It would have been diminishing returns on that information rather than expanding returns, unless the idea was simply to plug a leak. But certainly there have been, I'm sure, many more effective ways of doing that in the past. And one could imagine that could have been applied in this case. Why would it have been death? Unless, of course, there were other pieces of information that David Kelly had that people in positions of power were afraid of of having the whistle blown on. Well, let's return then to the illustrious career of David Kelly and the very interesting factoids about his life that we were presented with in that BBC profile of him at the beginning of today's episode. If certain pieces of information in that profile, such as the fact that he worked at Porton Down, started to ring a bell in your mind, then ding dong, we have a winner because you are paying attention. 
Yes, there are some very interesting pieces of information in the background of David Kelly that meant that he was privy to very interesting information. And although we can't be exactly sure of what that information was, well, we have some clues. And to start taking a look at those clues, well, let's listen to an excerpt from a documentary entitled Anthrax War. And I'm going to fess up right now that uh, this podcast is every bit as much a, a piece of discovery for me as it is for the listeners out there. So I, at this point, as I'm recording this on the 25th of June 2011, have not watched this documentary yet, although it is available online. I have only watched this clip. So... Well, let's let's listen to this and let's start exploring this together. Who may have wanted David Kelly dead and why? Gordon Thomas, an author who writes about the world of secret intelligence, had met David Kelly a few months before his death. David Kelly was a major part of the biological warfare intelligence world. He knew more than perhaps anybody I know, and perhaps anybody anybody knew. And he was brilliant. That's why he was always consulted by other intelligence services. If they got into a, a mess, CIA, Canadian intelligence, and they'd say, we better ask Dr. Kelly what he thinks. He had explored with two or three writers, of which I'm happy to include myself, the possibility he could write a book about his life. And I said to him at the time, you know, David, you signed the Official Secrets Act. He said, I know. And yes, I'll need somebody else to write it with the information I provide. I said, but you know, you won't get away with it, David. Intrigued by Thomas's account, Cohen decided to look into Kelly's place of work, Porton Town, the UK's secret biological and chemical weapons complex. Porton Down had received the aim strain from Fort Detrick in the 80s. Look at this. Prohibited. We're at Porton Down. David Kelly had been head of microbiology at Porton Down. At the time of his death, Porton Down was the target of a major police investigation. Codenamed Operation Antler. It looked into deaths and injuries to British soldiers caused by secret experiments conducted between 1939 and 1989. Intriguing indeed. Well, as I say, I have not watched this documentary in its entirety, so that's my homework and yours, because this seems like a promising way to start a real exploration into the types of secrets that David Kelly might have been might have been holding and the types of secrets that it might have been in the interests of certain intelligence agencies to cover up one way or another. For a little bit more information on that, I will direct you to the link that I will provide in the documentation section for today's episode to that clip, which also contains some information in written form about this clip, and it reads in part, quote, Over the course of several years, further digging, our film and book reveal many new details of Kelly's key role in the shadowy world of international germ warfare, including his direct dealings and the UK government's relationship with apartheid South Africa's notorious Project Coast program, which worked on developing an ethnic germ weapon that could target the country's black population. His possible links to illegal human experiments on British servicemen at Porton Down that were the focus of the largest ever police investigation by the Wiltshire Police, which recommended the charges be brought against Porton Down scientists. Unnoticed in the media storm surrounding the Kelly case at the time, the Crown Prosecution Service quietly decided not to pursue with the cases just days before Gel- Kelly was found dead on Harrow Down Hill. Further evidence that he was planning to write a book that could violate the Official Secrets Act. Was David Kelly the proverbial man who knew too much? And what secrets did he take to his grave? End quote. A very, very good question, and one that I will not pretend to have the answer to at this time. So, together, we will have to continue trying to dig out information about David Kelly, his connections, and what information he may have taken to his grave. <laughs> 